Welcome to the Startup Grind. Thanks very much. And now I'd like to get to the most exciting part of the evening and introduce you to our guest, Dan Norris. He's a serial entrepreneur, award-winning content marketer, international speaker, and author of number one Amazon bestsellers, Seven Day Startup and The Content Machine. I do have a bit of a blurb here, but I'm actually not going to read it all out because we're going to cover it off and ask him a lot more in the interview tonight. Um, I'm sure you've seen from the blurbs that are on the website and out and about. As well as that, Dan is also the co-founder of Black Hops Brewing, a craft brewing company. Um, and he's very passionate about helping people launch startups and sharing information as well. So in the typical startup grind style, I'd like to invite you to stand up, please, and join me in welcoming Dan with a round of applause. Welcome, Dan. Hello. Kind of weird. It is. Thank you for obliging. Normally you get clapped at the end. Well, if you're lucky, you might get one then too. No pressure. <laughs> All right. So, um, guys, tonight I would really value your input. Not only has Dan got a really interesting story, but we're going to be covering so many different elements that we can guide the conversation by what you're interested in. Um, you know, it could be anything from writing a book to crowdfunding to you know other specific questions about the business as well. So, submit your questions as we go. We're going to start off, Dan with, I guess, where it all started. What's your background? Um, what were your first jobs? That kind of thing. Okay. Um, so is this working? My mic? Yeah, I think so. Sweet. Background. Um, well, I, so I only lasted working a job for three years, I think, a real job. Um, and in that three years, I think I probably had 10 different jobs in the same company. I'd just like make up jobs for myself. And it was a big, it was a government company. No one cared if I did any work. So <laughs> I just kind of invented jobs. Um, and they just paid me to do courses and um, like training days and just, I can't remember doing legit work. Oh, like, that, that, <laughs> they paid me to like learn, learn how to code and, and my, like my university was human resources. And I just got in there and I'm like, nah, I, I want to like build, I want to learn how to code. Yep. So that, they didn't argue, they just let me do that, which is kind of weird as well, but it's good. Um, and then I just got bored and wanted to leave, so I, I quit. I think I got a promotion, um, and then I quit. <laughs> we all celebrated, went out, and then the next day I'm like, I'm, I'm gonna quit, sorry. And so I just quit, and then... Um, was that a big decision for you? Was that to do your own thing at that point? Yeah, uh, it seems big when you say it like that. Um, but it didn't feel that big at the time, it was just like I'm bored. And I was young, so I was like, well, I can always get another job. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just quit, and then, and then I, um, I wanted to build websites for people. And, and I'd never done that before, so I just went out and bought a whole bunch of books, learned how to build websites. I literally went to one meeting with a company and they said, oh, can you build the website in ASP? And I'm like, yeah, sweet. <laughs> I didn't know what ASP was. <laughs> so went and bought a book on how to use ASP and then built this shitty CMS. It probably had all sorts of security holes in it, so I'm not sure where that led. But um, <laughs> eventually... I, and, and I just did that for seven years. I ran that business. I never made any money, really. So you did start a business and it was a company that you ran? Yeah. Yep. So I started building websites for people. Pretty much every, everything I did failed, but not failed badly enough to stop. Just yes. failed from the point of view of, like, never made as much money as I did working. Yep. All my friends made more money than me, than me achieved more things than me. Um, it, it was just a shit business. I don't know. It was, just, it was a shitty business. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, every time I employed someone, I'd lose all the margin. I couldn't make any money. Mm. Um, I tried everything you could imagine to fix it. Like I bought two other businesses that were similar, thinking, you know, I could just kind of bolt that revenue on. Yeah. Um, and that just made it worse. Had to hire more people and lost more money. Um, I, I bought websites. I, I wrote hundreds of blog posts. I, I employed people overseas. I tried everything. What was that business called? Uh, Web Circle. Okay. It still exists. I, I ended up selling it. Actually, I even tried to give it to another person. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. And I couldn't even do that. Um, <laughs> How so long ago was this? It was in uh, 2012. Okay. Yeah. So, so in 2012, I'm like, okay, I've had enough. Um, so I, I managed to sell it, more or less because it had a bunch of recurring clients. I think I sold it for about 70 grand. 
but then I had no income. And so I gave myself a year to work on a startup. Yeah. Um, I applied to all the startup incubators, got rejected by all of them. Thanks if you're in the room. <laughs> so did you, have, you had some other ideas at that point? <laughs> yeah. In, in fairness, they were pretty shitty ideas. So it was probably, <laughs> probably pretty wise. Um, so were you pitching the same idea then or did you have a few that you were kind of working on? I had a few on? shitty ideas. Yeah. It wasn't just Multiple, one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to the um, round. Yeah, so then, but then I, so then I thought, oh, well, I'll just do it myself. Um, and so I gave myself a year and I built this thing which I called Web Control Room, which is, in hindsight was an awful name, um, which I changed. Um, but it was just like an analytics dashboard. And I spent a year building it. Building it um, and I just had all this good feedback from people. Like people were telling me, like, this is the best thing ever. Like, I wish I built this myself and all this. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Like, I was featured on Mashable and Next Web, And, like, cool. it, was, it was kind of cool, like, startup-y. I was getting excited. Uh, but then after a year, I realised I had absolutely no customers um, and no money. I spent all of that money. So was money. it a freemium kind of offer? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was free to sign up and that was $9 a month. I think I had, what was I, I think I was doing like $500 a month in recurring revenue, but I was spending thousands because yeah. I had developers. I'd forgotten how to code. I figured long ago that other people were better at it than I was. Um, so, and then I was just, I, I, I was basically out of money back applying for jobs. Yeah. Um, and that's when I launched WP Curve. Literally just, I went into a forum and said, um, what do you guys think of this idea? Everyone said, this sounds shit. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to launch it anyway. Great, I'll do it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't really have, it was either that or get a job. And I didn't, like I was looking for jobs on the Gold Coast. No one works on the Gold Coast. They just surf and drink, drink beer, so. Except for you now. Yeah, well, well yeah. So I, I, I was going to have to move back to Brisbane, which, you know, I don't want to offend anyone in the room, but I didn't want to do that. <laughs> Um, so I just sent an email out to my list and said, do you want to sign up for this uh, WordPress subscription for unlimited small jobs? And so how did you come up with that idea? Um, it, it was literally just like I was thinking about, because what I wanted was, my old business, it wasn't what I would call a startup. It was just like a local business, mm. um, which is kind of funny, which is where I've ended up doing a local <laughs> business. But um, I didn't like anything about it. There was nothing exciting about it. There was nothing scalable about it. There was nothing unique, differentiated about it. So... When I wanted to do the startup for the, with the analytics, I was like, well, this is going to be a proper startup. It's going to be like a high growth thing. If it takes off, it's going to turn into something real and you know, have yeah. customers around the world. So I focused my attention overseas and tried to build an audience in the US and build a, a, you know, like a product that wasn't just something that the person down the road was going to buy. Yeah. Um, and so with WP Curve, like I literally, like I didn't have a year, I only had two weeks. So I couldn't build software in two weeks. And so I just literally started thinking about, well, what are the... What are those criteria for like an actual startup? Or what, what are the bits from a startup I can build into a business that I can make in two weeks? Yeah. And so I could like I couldn't. So it all build... came down to two weeks. What's that? It all came down to two yeah. weeks. Yeah. Wow. And so, you well, it would have been weeks. out of money at the end of the two <laughs> weeks. I mean, I don't know what would have happened. I probably I probably would have got a job if someone yeah. employed me. But I don't even know what I would get a job doing because spending seven years being an entrepreneur, like you don't really ever get good at one thing. Because you're just doing so many things. Trying lots of different things. So I don't even know what... It, like, I'm thinking a blogger. Like, is that a, even a job? Actually, well, let's talk about blogging because I think that was something from my understanding of your history that you were doing throughout that period and yeah. that really then helped you when you launched WP Curve. You had an audience already. Yeah. Um, albeit more general, potentially. So mm. tell us a little bit about that blogging and what started that and how you got into it. Well, all of, the, all of the failing I was doing, I was doing it publicly. So it was a lot of fun for everyone else as well. <laughs> Good um, entertaining yeah. read, hey? So I was doing income reports. Um, well, just reports because there was no income. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and pe people, people like seeing people fail. Um, so I built a bit of an audience doing those. And I built an email list. I started just doing all this content. When I started the business, I was like, I'm going to build a business where I just do content because it's the only thing I like doing from other business. Yep. It's the only thing I like, I like, I like going on the computer and writing stuff. Um, whereas all the other stuff I hated, like going to coffee shops and trying to sell people websites, I just, I hated. Yeah. I hated everything about that business except for writing blog posts, which wasn't <laughs> my job. It was just so, yeah, something I thought might on the work. Side. And what were you writing them under at that point? Was it like under your name or under the business name that you were running then? So, I, so the Web Circle, the, the agency, I had a blog for that business, I'd written about 150 posts. I sold that. I sold that in all of my social media accounts when I sold that business. Right. So I literally started from scratch. Yep. Um, and then I started blogging on the the analytics company. And yep. then as soon as WP Curve started getting customers, I just transferred them all, transferred it all over. Yep. Changed my email address, and that was it. Okay. Yeah. So WP Curve, the idea you got 
did you validate it? Did you go through any of that kind of process in that period? Uh, what did you have to do before you kind of went, yeah, I think, I'm going to run with this? I think like the validation thing is, is just, it's not something I like. I don't like the idea of validating things. I think most, it's misunderstood and it's, it's just, it normally backfires. And so my thinking was, well, it's valid if someone pays me. Yep. And that was, so that was, it was, it was launch it and then And it was quick to launch, validation. I suppose, wasn't it? So it wasn't like you were building a product in that way that you had to kind of test and refine. Yeah. But I mean, in hindsight, I probably could have done the same thing with the last business. And I, it, it shouldn't have taken me $70,000 in a year to learn that my audience didn't want to pay me $10 for analytics. I mean, common sense probably should have told me that because analytics is pretty much free. And also just the fact that people weren't signing up to a product yeah, right. and me thinking that if I made the product better, they would sign up is pretty flawed. <laughs> so so um, WP Curve, you, how did you launch it? How did that, you know, what did you do in terms of resourcing and making that a business? Uh, nothing. So who were you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I can I'll answer your question more, <laughs> more thoroughly if you like. Um, <laughs> so I emailed my list and said, I've got a 24 hour support team available for your website. And that was me. And it was me with a mobile phone and a live chat app. When I went to bed at night, I'd put the live chat app next to my bed, um, which, which wasn't all that much fun. But you were offering <laughs> WordPress skills. So at that point, did you have decent WordPress skills? or Yeah, well, I've been building that? sites on WordPress since WordPress began. Okay. So I could fix most problems. And I, and I had one developer. Actually, my lead developer is a guy who used to work with me in my agency. And then he came across to the analytics dashboard and then yeah, cool. um, he was still with me. So I actually, like I wanted to keep him as well. Like that yeah. was part of the thing. It's like, shit, I actually need to make some money because otherwise I'm going to have to. And I actually had to give away another developer to a friend of mine who, who became like his best employee, which I was gutted about. Like he's not, a good, not that good a friend for me to be happy for him. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I just, I emailed my list and then said, uh, sign up. Um, it's 24 seven and then I just kept the live chat thing near my, near my bed at night and if, if, a, if a chat came through, normally what I'd do is like assess if it was urgent, which it never was yeah. and then I'd say no worries because we do like same day turnaround. So I'd, I'd be able to go back to sleep yeah. and then fix it in the morning. Right. And how did you decide the price point for that? Made it up. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I'd, uh, well, the thing is like it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be interesting if it was like 500 bucks a month. Because really then it's just like a support thing that yeah. you get from an agency. So I had to work backwards from like, if it's 70 bucks a month, it's interesting. Um, and, then I had, and then I had to be like, well, how much are the developers going to cost me to outsource all the work? And how many jobs are people going to request? That was the big thing. People thought like everyone's going to request a thousand jobs. Yeah. Which turned out to be an assumption that, was, that everyone was wrong on. So you're offering unlimited WordPress fixes for $70 a month. And what yeah. kind of, you know, how many... Unlimited. What is unlimited average for you? Well, so so there's restrictions to it. So there's 30 the 30 minute jobs. It's per website and it's same day turnaround, which means you could be waiting a whole day to get the job done. Yeah. So it's it's technically impossible to request more than like 30 jobs. Yes. And if you've got one website with 30 problems with it, <laughs> this, you've done something drastic, and yep. it, that hasn't happened yet. Okay. Great. In terms of your longevity of customers, like how long are you making them sign up for and you know, how's that been in terms of retention for you? Yeah, that's a big challenge. Um, so anyway, so just to end that last story, though, I didn't keep mm. this live chat thing going forever. So okay. I, I, a guy reached out to me through my blog post who had just moved to the US and he said, oh, do you, wanna, do you want someone to work in the US? And I was like, yes, I do. And I couldn't afford to pay anyone. So he came on as my co-founder. Um, and I literally had never met him before. I gave him half of the company and didn't meet him again for a year. <laughs> it was, How did that go? Ah, it's been up and down. <laughs> no, it's good. It was good. Yeah, meeting him was fun. Um, but yeah, because at the time it wasn't anything. It was just like this idea. It was kind of taking off. We only had like 20 or 30 customers. Yep. So it wasn't like I was giving him like a huge chunk of something hugely valuable. I mean, mm -hmm. it's pretty valuable now. But I thought if it gets to like, I'd rather own half of something that works and, you know, is worth millions rather than before only 100% of something that was worth 70 grand. Yeah. And what did he bring to the table? Like, how have you found that relationship? Well, it's funny because at the time it was like, I just want to do behind the scenes stuff. I don't want to do like public speaking and <laughs> events and stuff like that. No. And so no. he, he started doing that. And then now I just go around speaking at events. I don't know. I don't know why, but that's yeah, how it I, worked I out. I helped you with that. I started that off. <laughs> I, I actually convinced Dan to speak for me about two years ago at one of my other digital marketing events where Dan did a great job talking about content. Um, 
which we might kind of move on to in a second as well. Because uh, it seems, I think that's been fairly fundamental in your in your life, obviously. It's something you enjoy, but it's something that you've kind of built into everything you've done. Yeah. Well, it's so I started doing those, those income reports and then they went well. And then the WP Curve blog goes pretty well. I've, I hired a guy and I pretty much delegated all of that and then did all my personal stuff under Seven Day Startup. And I've now got a guy who works for me for that. He does all of that content. Does anyone here get the WP Curve emails? Excellent. They're very refreshing, so I recommend you go sign up for them. They're very transparent. They share everything. Go back and have a read. It's really interesting to, you know, get the insides on what another company is doing as they go through the startup phase. I think. Yeah. So that that content was going pretty well, and then the seven day startup stuff just kind of took off. So I, I find so it more fun to write about well, that. Have you um have we jumped a book here? Did you? I wrote a couple of books as well. Yeah. Let's time. let's <laughs> well, we'll try and stick a little bit chronologically for the ease of keeping it in order here. Yeah. So you wrote a book. At this point, that was the seven-day startup, your first book. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I don't know. I just never thought of writing a book before. And then Alex... And then you went, hang on, I like writing. Yeah, and I did it in like a week. It was really easy. Alex, oh. Alex said, you should, you should write a book about... Actually, he didn't even say what about. And I thought, well, we can just do the seven-day startup thing because we'd launched the business in seven days, or I had. And then I'd also tried it with a bunch of other projects because I kind of like the idea of, yeah. of just skipping the validation and then just actually launching something, getting customers and using real information from customers rather than kind of sitting around talking Thinking startup about it. talk. Um, Great. So yeah, so, that, so I wrote the book. I literally, I was going to put it up on the site um, as a free download. And then another guy reached out to me, Tom Morks, who's a book marketing guy, and he says, no, you should put it on Amazon. And I put it on Amazon. It was going to be free. So and did then, he find you through your blog? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then... Um, Just checking. Yeah, everyone finds, finds it through the <laughs> blog. It's good. <laughs> well, I guess that's how they know in advance what you're doing, right? Yeah. And then he like helped me. So I had a bunch of people reach out to work, work on it for free. I don't know why, but so the editor did it for free. The formatter did it for free. The designer did it for free. Tom marketed it. I, I can't remember. I might've might paid him a little bit. I can't remember. Um, but so he put it on Amazon and they have a rule where you have to actually, this is funny. Cause this happened to the guy who wrote the Marsh, uh, the, the Martian, is that the movie with Matt Damon? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The same thing happened to that guy. Like he put his book, it, it was free on his site and he put it on Amazon. Amazon forced you to charge yeah. once, once the free period runs out because they're quite good at making money, Amazon. Um, <laughs> Funny that. And, yeah, and then so I just put it up there and, and then it became like something that people had to buy and it started ranking and it did really well. So what did you sell it for when you launched it? I don't even know. I think it was, well, it was free. It was free for a week and then I think it was like a dollar for Kindle and then it, and then it went up to normal prices. Yeah. Because there's a, there's a physical book and a Kindle book and a lot of people don't realize how easy it is to make a book. Like it, it, it cost me literally nothing. And, it, and I didn't have to pay for any printing because Amazon have a print on demand service called CreateSpace. So mm -hmm. anytime you, you buy the book, they print it straight away, send it out. It doesn't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. I can order a hundred of them at like $7 a book. Um, so it's, it's, it's a no brainer for someone to write a book. Yeah, great. And I'm so I just keep, I keep doing it now. It's <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> Did you do any big launch around that book? I'm just trying to think whether it's really. the next one. I don't really like big launches. I, I, um... Sorry, maybe big launch is the wrong phrase. I know you did a lot of work in the background to pre-launch, I suppose, or I did, yeah. generate a bit of hype. What I did, I do this every time I launch anything, is I, I get a Facebook group together and I just be as generous as possible in that group. And then I tell them in return for me being in the group and helping you guys out, uh, you guys can help me when I launch the book and get a free copy of it and promote it on social media. Yep. And we did. I did that with... That book, this, the second book, Content Machine, I did it with the brewery. Um, I'm going to do it with the brewery book, which is going to come out in a week or two. Um, and another book I've written as well. So it's a good So you're still turning books out like in a week, two weeks, or is it taking a bit longer? Uh, it depends on the book. The brewery <laughs> one took a long time because it's a lot of technical stuff that I don't really understand. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, God, it's awful. The editing a book is a horrible process. Yeah, but. Don't ever, don't ever start an editing business. Your clients <laughs> will hate you no matter how good you are. Yeah. Yeah, it's not sounds a fun painful. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you talk us a little bit about, I suppose, what's happened to the seven day startup since you wrote the book? Yeah. Because you built the Facebook group, and then I know you now you run courses around that virtually as yeah, well. Yeah, so I've done a few things. I've, I've, got, a, I've got a paid community, uh, Seven Day Startup Pro, which has got 200, 230 members. Um, the book sells quite well, and it sells a lot overseas, like uh, diff for different languages. Cool. which is cool, both books. Um, and then I've done challenges where people launch either a business or a project in a week. And I kind of get, either get speakers in or just I do like a daily call and give away prizes. I normally give away books because I don't like keeping things and I just acquire all these books. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, it's been fun. It's been really cool. It's mostly people launching online businesses. Yep. Um, and, and I really like that. I do website reviews. I just sit on there for hours reviewing people's websites. It's really fun. <laughs> How do you find the time? I don't watch TV and I don't commute to yep. work. Yeah. So that's about... A few hours a day. It's about 20 hours a week. Yeah. More than everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still giving a lot in terms of what you're doing these days. You're still helping other people out for free a lot, giving advice, obviously sharing on your blogs. Yeah, well, well I think if you... That's the work I like doing. So I, I try to get people to do the work I don't like doing or that I'm not good at, yeah. which is most things. Um, <laughs> and then I just do the fun stuff. So what does it look like now that you've got a few books and we're going to get into the brewery in a moment, but what's happening with WP Curve while this is going on? Um, good question. There's, so it's, it's going well. It's still, um, it's still, we, we've still got 40 developers around the world. We've got thousands of customers. Um, we're sort of in a phase where, where we're, we're wondering what to do, whether we sell it or whether we um, branch out into something a bit broader. Mm -hmm. we, we've, we've just said no to absolutely everything. Like we, we get requests for everything and we say no because at the moment it's a really nice business to run. Yeah. Um, it enables us to do other things. Um, so I don't know. We'll and you're see. still involved with your partner in running that? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. what role does he have kind of day to day? He, he sort of oversees the service. I look after marketing. Um, he oversees the service. We have two team leaders who run the team. Um, and people for everything. Like none of us have, there's not really any job that either of us have to do every week other than we have a weekly call. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah. Sounds like a, I mean, is this a lifestyle business? Is that what you call well, that's, it? Well, I guess that's the, that's the argument is do you keep it the way it is and, and don't have to do much or do you, which doesn't really sit that well with me because it's... Do you like starting things? Yeah, I like starting things and I like doing something significant rather than just like kind of making Probably a bit of money it. and yeah. 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 yeah, you don't need money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't know, we'll see. Okay, a few questions before I, we keep going. How do you know which shitty idea to go for? Oh, that's a good question. I was thinking about this the other day. I've got, I've got so many shitty ideas at the moment. I had another good one last <laughs> night. Um, <laughs> another good shitty idea? I don't know. I think, well, I think the, the best thing you can do is just, if you can launch stuff really quickly, you'll, you'll figure out very quickly if it's not shit. And I, don't, I still don't know. I never know whether what I'm doing is going to work. Even that, even that book, like I remember uploading it to Amazon just thinking like, I don't know if anyone's going to buy this. But then I thought it, it could actually go really well. And it sold like 40,000 copies. And awesome. made, I made more money from the book than I de ever did with my last business. Yeah, right. um, so I still don't know. I, I, don't, I never know what's no, going to be good. There's no perfect recipe. No, there's not even, there's not even a recipe. There's like, I'm absolutely completely clueless if something's going to work or not. So I just try to launch as many things as possible and just pay attention to traction. So How like, many things have you launched in the last, say, two years? Like, is this something that's happening in the background as well um, as all these other things? I try, or? really try really hard not to launch anything new at the moment because I've got too much on. Yeah. Yeah, but over, over the years, so many different things. I don't even know how many, 20, 30, 50, I don't know. And what happens then when you kind of cut them off? Do you just close it down? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Walk away? Yeah. Go with the next one? And some people get annoyed, but people have got way more important things to be annoyed about, so it doesn't last that long. Yeah. How can Australian other Australian startups learn to fail better, and for the community to accept that failure? Uh, I mean, you obviously are comfortable in kind of trial, but I guess that's not necessarily the approach for, for everyone. I don't know. It's one of those things. It's like um, it's kind of like I don't want to promote the idea of failing because it's kind of something you you actually probably don't want to do. Um, but I think like the way I see it now, I don't really have any shame around like if I if I launch something and it doesn't work. I actually don't care. Like, m most people care too much, I think. Like, now I just think it's, it's just like a... Actually, one book that helped me is a book called Psycho-Cybernetics, which is... A bit, it's it's not, nothing to do with startups, but it's, it talks about, like, any time you want to get good at anything, you're basically failing to correct course. Mm. So, every, so, so you know you're going in a certain direction, and every time you fail, you just put back on track to go in that direction. Yes. So that's the way I think about it. It's just like a bunch of different experiments. If it fails, it just means it puts you back on track and you keep going. So I don't know if that helps the person who asked the question, but that helps me to think about it that way. Yeah, right. And what about your transparency in terms of your business? I mean, obviously that's something that's fairly unique as well. Not everyone's out there sharing their figures every month and yeah. you know, how they're tracking. What well, some people you... do, but they make them up. <laughs> well, that's right. What made you decide that you know, it was going to be okay to share those figures? Um, and are you still doing it? I, I don't know. We don't share revenue with WP Curve. Actually, it just became not interesting to people anymore. Mm. Like it was interesting when it was when it growing. was either failing or growing a lot. Yeah. But once it was like just kind of growing a little bit each month, and we got the same monthly revenue, you know, visits are going up a little bit. People yeah. actually didn't care anymore. Yeah. 
Um, so it's a good we part just try of the story. To, yeah, yeah. I, I just try to do stuff that people are interested in, and I think um, I think that the thing with content is like it has to be different. So if you if you're starting a WordPress support business now and you think oh, I'll do monthly reports because people do this all the time, they just copy the idea and they like start doing these monthly reports. It's not going to work. No. Because because it's been done. Yeah. Um, whereas with the brewery, which I know I'm skipping ahead again, but the, okay. the, that approach of transparency for the brewery has been amazing for us. Like we haven't spent a cent on marketing mm. and um, we've just blown this thing up out of nothing. And, and it's exactly the same approach, just that transparency, sharing the information, releasing recipes and just applying it in a different industry where, where it's a secretive industry. So it's like not the sort of thing that people have seen before. Yeah, right. Um, so it's different. Tell us about that. Let's jump in there. How did, how did it come about? Have you always wanted to make beer? <laughs> no, I was, I, I, so, so me and my two mates are sitting in a bar, one of them is a brewer, uh, the other one just likes beer, like most, <laughs> most sensible people, um, <laughs> and, and he was talking about the beer idea, and our other mate Gov said, oh, I can make that, I just got a pilot system, I'm going to make this, we, it was an eggnog stout, that, that was his idea, to make, make a stout that tastes like eggnog, um, so it was like cinnamon and brandy and nutmeg and that, and um, so then I just thought, I thought nothing of it. I thought it was just like one of those things where people are talking shit and then nothing will happen. And then like two weeks later, he messaged me and said, oh, we're going back up to the Mount Tambourine to brew this beer. You want to come? And I'm like, yeah, all right, sweet. I was actually shocked um, <laughs> that he was actually doing it. Um, and then again, it's just been the traction thing. Like, like one thing just led to another and I got carried away. Like, well, like we did the homebrew and I'm like, oh, we probably need a name and we probably need a website and an Instagram account and some branding and some labels. <laughs> and so I just went nuts and set all this stuff up before we'd even tasted the beer. <laughs> and by the time we tasted the beer, we had a website, we had labels printed, we took photos, put on Instagram, we sent it out to bloggers and they started writing about us as if we were like a brewery. And they were saying like, you know, I can't wait for the commercial release, like this pre-release special covert operation from Black Ops and we're like far out. <laughs> Can you tell me, just expand on that, we sent it out to bloggers. What, what does that mean? What does that look like? Oh, it, it was, they're more or less just our mates, like guys in the yeah. industry. Like we were sort of in the industry going to bars and stuff. Um, so we knew the people, like we were just, Eddie, Eddie my mate would just go and have beer with someone and give them, a, give them the beer. And then we were actually, we didn't think anything would happen, but then one of the bloggers wrote a review and that just led to lots of other bloggers writing reviews. Right. And awesome. put, you put it in like a craft beer app and gave it four stars. And it's like a really discerning beer blogger. Um, and so from then on, it was like, well, we need to make this. Yeah, right. Like for, pub, for pubs and then we just one thing after another and now we opened a brewery. How did you go from kind of a mate coming to brew the beer to being a partner or being involved in um, the business? So, so, so it was all fun at that point and then we said, well, okay, so what, what do we have to do to brew a beer and sell it in bars? A, you need to get a, a, a license, which is not that hard to actually make beer. Um, and then you need to brew it at someone else's brewery because we didn't have one. And, and basically brew on the smallest batch possible so you don't have to put too much money into it. Which is, this, it's the same startup idea, it's, a, it's an MVP of beer, I guess. Yeah. So, so yeah. we had the, the homebrew version and then we had the smallest possible commercial batch we could do which was 800 litres. Um, and we, we did that and we, we sold it all to bars before it was made again, had a big launch party. Cool. And didn't make any money on, off it but we just kept doing that, what they call contract brewing. A lot of the beers you drink are not brewed at, at the brewery. Um, mm. that, that is written on the bottle. It's, yeah, it's right. not unusual at all. Um, so we, we were brewing at a bunch of different breweries and just putting it out, not making any money, in some cases losing money. Yep. Um, but for the most part, just kind of keeping, like we put five grand in, I think at the start, and we just kind of kept that balance. And you had a really interesting launch. Tell us about that. Uh, we, well, we've had a, had a few launches. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Call of Duty was what I was thinking. But yeah, so, so again, that came about, so, so Call of Duty sent us an email and it was funny because they sent us an email saying, oh, we've got this new game coming out called Black Ops 2. And then Eddie's like, well, I've got this email from some Andre character, it's probably spam. Um, <laughs> it doesn't even have the right name of the game because it was Black Ops 3, it was the wrong name uh. in the game. And I was like, I'm just going to look into this because if this is real, this is either we're getting sued or, um, or we can make this beer. And I looked into it, we got back to him and it turned out like they'd, they were aware of our content and they'd heard it because people were writing stories about us like the, um, we're getting press, the blog was taking off, we did a podcast, um, I started writing a book. So we're getting all this attention and they, they had the idea of brewing a beer for the release of Call of Duty and the game's called Black Ops and so our name came up. Right. And luckily they didn't sue us, instead they decided to collaborate with us on doing the beer. 
Awesome. So yeah. what did that look like? What did that mean? Um, basically, again, we contract brewed it in a facility in Sydney. We did 5,000 litres, um, which is a lot, 600 cartons of beer, I think. They were mm. all sold online. Um, they flew us down to Sydney. They had like a crew of five people and a director to like direct this wow. video for the launch. And then they had like a press, a press thing where they like got it on all these massive news sites. We were on Channel 9 News. Um, didn't get on Koshi What stage though. was this? Was this like... <laughs> 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 next time, next time. Yeah. What stage was this we in didn't the process for you? Right. It's the same thing. It was, like, it was like that ASP thing. It was like, can you make this beer? And we're like, yeah. And they got off the phone, you know, we don't have a brewery. Ah, oh, shit, that's right. <laughs> Get around that, hey? Yeah. So it was, it was just, I mean, we, we didn't make any money off it. We actually lost money off it in the end because we made a mistake uh, on part of it. But um, we got a lot of attention. Yeah. yeah. And has that been, in, like, you know, influential in moving forward with that? Um, yeah. I think it's, it's always very hard to measure. Yeah. I'll always do anything to get attention. I mean, from, <laughs> from a business point of view, because I think it's good, valuable, free marketing. But um, it, you can never measure it. Yeah. That's why it's good to not spend money on it. Like, if you're spending money on content and press and stuff, it, it becomes really hard because mm. you just, you actually, like, every, a lot of people have heard of our business before we even had a brewery. Yes. Um, and that's all because of the content and the press. But how do you actually measure whether or not that's been valuable if you're putting money into it? Yeah. So, that, yeah, that's, that's the easiest thing for me is, is to try to, Try to make up, not make up stories, but like actually seek out stories. Mm. So like uh, the Call of Duty thing, like as soon as I saw that, I'm like, it wasn't about making money. It's like, we're going to get so much attention for this thing. Like yeah. that's going to be epic for our brand um, and credibility. Like a lot, every purchasing decision is about trust. So if people see you associated with a brand like that, it's just immediate credibility. Yeah. Um, crowdfunding thing was the same. It was like, it was, yes, it was a good idea to do, but in the end it was more, it was more about, well, it was as much about the story and getting the press and building the and you can fund the book, the beer, did you? Yeah, we or the book or both or. Uh, well, we the idea was like we'd we'd use it to pay for our bottling machine. We were running out of money. We were like massively over budget with the brewery because we were trying to do it for like three hundred thousand dollars, which was just idiotic. Um, but we thought we could always think I can do stuff, but then I can't. It was one of those ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then we thought, okay, we better do this crowdfunding thing. And we raised 18 grand, which was good, but it wasn't enough in the end to not have to get more money. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was the f like, no brewery has actually launched via crowdfunding, so that mm. was the angle. So it was like Australia's first brewery to launch via crowdfunding. Was that on Possible? Yeah. Yes. Anyone interested in talking more about crowdfunding? That's a fantastic question. <laughs> well, you can ask it in real life if you want. IRL. Yeah. <laughs> my, my question, I was just about to start talking about Mm. you ever thought about taking on investors who you first No one's ever wanted to give me any money for any of my <laughs> ideas, um, which, again, in hindsight, probably wise on their part. The, the, um, I think we could probably get funding now for WP Co, but then that's, again, the conversation of, like, do we actually want to create stage. something? Like, we, we've yeah. got competitors who've been bought out by big companies, um, so that, that option's there. Um, mm. But it, I think the idea has to be right. Like, we've got investors for Black Ops, but not VC investors, just like a couple of mates who put in 100 grand or something like that. Um, I don't know, I think funded startups, I would, I would kind of like to do it, I think, but I think it would really have to be the right idea. I think people get way too distracted with that and you just end up chasing funding and you just kind of forget about making something that people care about. Hmm. Good answer. Um, one of the questions here is, um, Sounds fun. There's a few funny <laughs> ones here actually. Um, what stage of the idea do you decide to register it as a business? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So again, it's just about, it's not getting ahead of yourself. Like we, when we first did the homebrew, at that point it was literally just a partnership agreement that I, I stole from Google somewhere and just like <laughs> changed the name to me and just said like, if we're gonna do this, we're, we're gonna go in together. Um, but then, you know, as soon as you have to sell something commercially, that's when you have to get an ABN, you have to mm. get a license. Um, but we didn't do it prematurely. We just did it literally as soon as we needed it. Yep. Um, and then, as soon as we decided we're going to build a brewery, which is much more significant than, um, you know, just brewing at someone else's brewery. Like there's only there's only three breweries on the Gold Coast. And right. There was only there was only one at the time that when we decided to do it. So it's not the sort of thing that everyone's doing on their weekend. So what um, stage is it at now? It's open. You've got it. It's open. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And how's it going? It's good. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of beer. <laughs> and I've got my office upstairs, so it's like it's really hard to get distracted 
do work instead of drinking beer. But good. <laughs> and now, now I'm like working behind the bar. It's, I've gone full circle. Wow. I've gone back to like shitty uni jobs. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah. So the, so then so when we decided to build the brewery, it was we didn't we needed money because because none of us had any money. Yeah. Well, we had enough to, to like we had a few hundred thousand dollars, um, but we didn't have enough to, to do all of it. So. Um, that was when we did a proper, like we got a proper lawyer in who charged us way too much um, to put together a, like a proper shareholder agreement and, and we did a pitch deck and we, did, we, we came up with a valuation and sold equity. So we, so we did that all that properly, but only at the point when we, when we knew we needed that's when, that. Oh, that's when you needed the funding yeah. we did that? Yeah, I would have avoided it. I mean, if I had the money myself, I would have put it in, but... And how did you work out your valuation at that point? I mean, you were, were you pre-sales or were you...? Yeah. Uh, well, we had we had beer out there, but we weren't making any money. Yeah. So it's really hard. Um, I, I just made it up. I, I, I kind of made up a number that, to me, represented like a good amount of money for something that didn't yet exist. Yeah. And it's for really, what your time and effort so far. Yeah. Like, but but it's also like you have to value it yourself. Like I've seen these these breweries doing crowdfunding, like equity crowdfunding in New Zealand, where they've got this brand that's all around Australia and New Zealand. They've got this epic business, and then they're valuing it at like one point five million dollars. And I'm like. You're, you're forgetting how hard it is to build something that's worth $1.5 million or to, to build a brand like at that scale. You're like massively undervaluing what you're doing. Mm. So I think you need to really value what you're doing, even if it doesn't exist. It's just your job to convince the investors that, that what you're doing is something they don't want to miss out on. So what's next for the brewery? Um, good question. So what's your distribution like now? At the moment, so we've got a cellar door where, where you can come there and taste our beers. It's very small. It's about the size of this stage area. And that's because it's close to neighbours. So um, we're pretty restricted with that. And we're, we're in a location, we're in a really good location in Burley, literally like 200 metres to the beach, probably the closest brew to the beach any, anywhere. Awesome. Um, and so the location's epic, but we're, we're kind of running out of space already. Right. So um, there's a couple of options. One is to do a bigger off-site brewery which I don't really find that exciting. Um, the other is to do brew pubs, which to me is more interesting because I think people in Australia aren't really doing it yet and I think in a few years they'll be everywhere. Can you talk me through that? Yeah, just a, uh, basically a restaurant with a brewery on site. Uh -huh. So New Newstead in Brisbane is an example. Um, Catchman at West End, Brisbane Brewing Co. at West End. Um, Green Beacon at Newstead are kind of a brew pub. Okay. There's, there's a bunch in Brisbane. There's a fairly specific question here. Does Black Ops offer contract brewing opportunities to start up breweries? We really wanted to, but again, <laughs> we, we literally filled our tanks up in the first week. Mm. Can, can someone, how do I know who, answered, who asked the question? They're just like, oh, cool. Okay, that's good, then they can raise their hand. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, we really wanted to do that because part of the reason why we built the brewery was because we, could, we ran out of places to contract brew elsewhere. Um, and if, if lots of startups could contract brew Mm, you know, as much together. as they wanted, you just get this massive community of people entering the craft beer scene, which is what we want. Um, and so we really wanted to do that, but literally, like, because of our, our, our lack of space there, we filled up the tanks in the first week and, and they've been full ever since. And then last week, our coolers crashed and we haven't been able to do anything for a week. Um, that's another story. Um, but yes, we will do it. Um, we've, got a couple, we've got a couple of collaborations we're doing. We've, we've just done one with uh, custom shoes, you know, the shoes. Um, we've done a beer called the Kramer, which is like a 10th anniversary of their shoe. It's like a, and it's got like Kramer's head on it. I'm not sure about the trademark issues there, but <laughs> I didn't do the design for that one. Um, so we do, we do collabs. We did a beer with Stone and Wood um, and Bolter and Burley. And we've done, we've done beers with Mountain Goat. And um, we've got a couple of guys coming in to brew there as soon as the tank's available. But it's not going to be able to uh, be something we can do often. I think what will happen, actually what is definitely happening, is there's, uh, brew, there's contract brewing breweries opening up in South East Queensland. And that's what you have in, like Brew Pack in Sydney is where we did the Call of Duty beer. Those places just exist to brew other people's beer. And half of the, the beer you get in the bottle shop in the craft beer section is brewed at Brew Pack or a place like it. Mm. And th there's one going in in a few different areas around here. And once that happens, a lot of other people will be able to brew, which is cool. How are you finding the growth of that business now, kind of after a launch and after the, the excitement of that? Uh, it's, it's really cool. It's, it's sort of, it's not a very sexy business beer. It's like it's, online businesses are so much better because it's just like everything with beer is like you have to put money into it. Like you have to 
spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on the tank, you have to fill the tank with beer, which is tens of thousands of dollars. Um, you have to pay the government in excise the second the beer leaves the brewery, regardless of whether it sells. Right. Um, and then you have to pay staff and, and local. There's a know, lot of logistics so, involved. So many logistics and transport, and like we don't even store beer on site there because we don't have enough room. Mm. So you're storing beer off site, you're paying keg rental, you're paying staff, we've got a sales guy. And this is all before you make any money. Yeah, right. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty savage business, but it's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> what percentage of your time are you spending on that business now? At the moment, pretty close to 100. Yeah. 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 Okay. One of the things I want to talk about that I kind of know from your blog and from speaking with you in the past is that you're awesome at building momentum um, with the things that you're about to launch and the things that you're communicating. And I was wondering if we could kind of get a bit tactical for a moment and talk about some of the tools or ways that you have built that momentum. Um, and I guess one example I have in mind was that I know you've done some stuff, um, and I don't know the tool you used, but it was like a tweet where you mm -hmm. schedule that and get everyone to kind of say that the tweet on the same day. Can you talk yeah. us through some of those kind of tools, perhaps, that might be of interest to the group? Yeah, so that one, I'm not sure about that one. It's called Thunderclap. Um, so it, it basically, you pre-schedule. So the idea is that you launch on, if you're launching something on the 1st of August, what's the date? Is it uh, about yeah. that? <laughs> it's 20. Uh, launching something on the 1st of August, everyone agrees to send out a tweet on that launch date. Um, but I don't know, like, I don't, I don't even know if anyone pays attention to Twitter anymore. Like, the tweet, tweets go out and people don't really see them, I think. I think it's more, like, it's, like, that's, it's good, like, it's to get that burst, but... Did you get some momentum off that when you used it? It's hard to tell. Like, yeah. like, the tweets go out and you see yourself tagged in them and you like them. But whether people actually see... I think Twitter's a bit of a... It's just a, a bit of... It's full of vanity metrics. Like, you don't actually know if people are seeing what's on there. You don't. Yeah. Although I was speaking to some people here tonight who said they saw it on Twitter, so... There you go. It can, yeah. it can work. Well, it's hard. It's, it's hard, hard to, to tell. That, I, yeah, think it's, I think it's. I think it's good. I think like the. So so anyway. So so what I normally do momentum is to, uh, first of all, start talking about the idea as early as possible. Put up a landing page, which you can do with Word, WordPress uh, or lead pages or something for z virtually zero dollars. Um, normally get something designed like a book. I get a, a cover design on Fiverr, or something. Put an email opt-in on there. I've got an email system, so I'm collecting emails maybe a year, like as far out as you possibly can yeah. draw attention to it. Um, once people opt into the emails, you invite them into an ambassador group. So, so there's, there's, like, there's like a, so there's something I learned on the, book, on the book launch, there's a small percentage of your audience who are just really keen to support you much more than the average person would support you, mm. um, which I never thought would be a thing. But, but that, that's proven out in everything I've done, even with the brewery. We've got an ambassador group for the brewery and uh, the crowdfunding and that group actually bought out 50%. Like we hit 50% of our goal for the crowdfunding in the first hour, all just by using that group of 150 people. Wow. So how do you engage that group once you've kind of identified them? Yeah. So 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 that everyone gets email inviting them to the group, and then I just I just use Facebook, and everyone tells me it's a bad idea, but I I don't listen because it works very well. Um, so that's where your group is. Yeah. Physically. Yep. Yeah. And then. Um, Facebook, it just works well because it's really low friction for people. They can get it on their phone. They can, you can easily tag people. Um, and we just put content in there. We help people. Like a lot of it, like for the beer one, it's, it's home brewers and it's people. Like we're, we're getting inquiries, multiple inquiries a day about our equipment because we were the first company to order from this supplier in China. Right. Um, and we actually went to China and inspected it. And like we bought a, we bought a brewery on Alibaba. It was kind of frightening. Um, <laughs> So everyone's everyone's nervous. Get anything on there, hey? Yeah, <laughs> and I'd been ripped off on there before too, but not for. So yeah, spending like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on there was pretty new. Big step. Uh, um, but yeah, so so people people have questions about that equipment, staff, craft, like home brewers want to know about beer. It's exactly the same with the startup stuff. People have questions about websites. They want sites reviewed. Just be as generous as possible. Go in there, help them so out. So you find that those people that are asking for your time are generally the ones that you know it's going to pay off for you. Because I mean, I guess that's everyone's concern is that they're putting you know time and effort into one side, and they might not be their customers potentially. I think I think that's again, it's just thinking about it the wrong way. Like it's like um, you never get a direct return from anything like that. Hmm. You, you never get a direct return from content. Never get a direct return from press. You never get a direct return from generosity. But you always get a return. So in one way or another, and if you believe it's like a, if you believe it's going to work, kind of sounds a bit lovey-dovey, doesn't it? Like a religion or something. Um, but 
yeah, I mean, if, 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 you, if, if you have the idea that, okay, if, I, if I'm going to be useful to people and people are going to trust me, then if I ask them for support for something in the future, they're probably going to be more likely to support me. Yeah. And it's an, it's, it makes sense. Of course they're going to be. That's very true. Are there any other tools that you'd recommend people check out or consider, you know, um, I suppose from that marketing perspective? Yeah, so, uh, so email, I mean, just simple, lightweight tools. Drip is good for email automation. They just sold to lead pages. Rob's a friend of mine, so that was cool. Um, awesome. What else? I like, Facebook groups I find really useful. Slack I use for communicating with all the various teams and the various businesses. Um, Google Docs I use for everything, even writing books. Um, I could go on about tour. Trello I use for everything. So all, all, I think all of those are free. The, the only one that I pay for is um, email automation. So using Fusionsoft, the WP Curve and Drip. Building an email yeah. list is still, is still a really important thing to do. Mm. Um, what about search? Do you rely on search a lot? No, I, I mean, we get lots and lots of traffic from from Google, but only because we put good content yeah, out. Yeah, streaming it by your content. Yeah, and I think it's I think it's like we've moved from a point of view of like trying to outsmart Google, and now but I think people never really used to understand what Google wanted, but now everyone knows. It's like, yeah, it wants good content. You don't have to do much to to optimize your, your content on your site. It's like a five minute job to make sure that when you put out a bit of content, yeah. it's optimized. The rest looks after itself. It should work. Yeah. You mentioned before that you don't like speaking. Um, <laughs> so, how did you get to the point where you are speaking quite a bit? What was that process for you? Um, I just decided to speak at an event. So, I, I, did, I did one public speaking event 10 years ago when I was working at QR and it was so bad. Like, I, like I signed up for it. It was in November and the start of that year I started worrying about it. I was just shitting myself. Um, and then I missed the flight. I was, I, the plan was to fly down on the day and present that day. And I'd visualise like this huge auditorium of people. And I literally like, it was, it was a bad idea to do that anyway, because you don't want to do that. But I did that. I missed the flight. The, the flight I did go, got hit by lightning. And I'm scared shit was a flying to start with. It was fine. I didn't die. Um, <laughs> but, and then I did that event and I was like, I'm just never doing this again. And yeah. so I, I didn't even really go to it. I didn't go to many events for another like 10 years. Yeah. And then after that, I'm like, well, if I'm going to be an entrepreneur, I probably do need to be able to speak at events. So I just started saying yes. Um, and then, so I did WordCamp in Sydney. It was the first one. And then, I, and then people just, heaps of people started asking me to speak at events. And I'd still normally say no, but if it's, if it's a good, if it's, it's a thing where I think I can help people and it's the right sort of crowd, I'll say mm. yes. Um, and what about your confidence and your comfortability on stage as well? How has that changed? Does, you know, did you just... Make yourself do it, or have you got yeah. tips or tricks? I know there's some people yeah. here that are going to be doing, you know, pitch presentations and things like that. What what advice can you offer them? Um, the first thing I did, which was extremely valuable, was go to speaker training with a guy called Dwayne Alley. Uh, he runs it on the Gold Coast every couple of months, and he's he's like a sort of Aussie Tony Robbins guy. Like he's got all the tricks. Like it would blow your mind what what guys like that do on stage and the amount of thought that goes into absolutely every single thing they do. Right. Everything down to like what's on the table or what's written under your seat or like where they hold their thumbs when they put their hands in their pockets and you know when what direction the sign up table is in when they're gesturing. Like it, it makes you actually appreciate the amount of skill that goes into a good public speaker. Yeah, right. And and, and it's, it's the most intense thing I've ever done that I absolutely hated at the time but then afterwards I was a lot more confident because I could go to events and I could see everyone else is making these mistakes and I could at least see the mistakes and work on correcting them for yeah. myself. So that was one thing. Um, the other is just realising it's all the before the event that's that's frightening for me. Mm. Like when I'm actually talking on stage, it's fine. Yeah. And I, that was something I realised with the WordCamp, like I was so scared about that event. And then I was up there on stage and I'm like, oh shit, I'm just talking. And these people are listening, it's kind of cool. <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't even a thing, it was just kind of like talking. Yeah. Um, so you just got to remember that it's, it's, it's you worrying about something that when you get there, you actually, and there's a, there's a moment where I was like, I actually quite, kind of enjoy this. Like the actual speaking part of yeah. it, I kind of enjoy. Yeah. It's just everything leading up to the all the worry. and the lead up, yeah. yeah. Excellent. What was that dude's name? Dwayne Alley. Dwayne Alley. Yeah. You should uh, tell him he might, <laughs> might be getting some inquiries. <laughs> yeah, I, sent, I just sent my girlfriend there. She hated it as much as me, but she said it's the best thing she's ever done as well. Awesome. Yeah, nice. um, it's just, it's one of those, it's like everything you do, it's like you kind of, the, the pros make it look easy, but there's so much that goes into, <laughs> you pick any skill, these the people have been working on it for their whole life yeah. and they've perfected it, and, and or they're con continuously perfecting it. And yeah. public speaking, like once you do that course, 
and you go to events, you, you, you're blown away by the amount of mistakes that every single public speaker makes. So if you're ever going to do any public speaking, I think doing speaker training is a, is a no-brainer. Maybe we can get a group discount, hey? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It, well, it's, it's pretty, it, was, it was like a thousand bucks for three days which I think is pretty damn good. I mean, people are selling like ebooks for a thousand bucks, so. Yeah, that's it. Okay, we are nearly finished. I appreciate there are some people standing, so thank you very much for uh, standing up. There are one or two chairs available still. We've got a few more minutes. I'm gonna run through some of the questions that have been submitted, so just some short answers as we can uh, cover them off for people here. Really important one here. What's your favorite beer that you brew? Um, hmm. We just brewed a beer with sponge cake in it <coughs> called <laughs> A salt trifle for Gav. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we came ninth out of out 150 breweries in the festival in Melbourne. Um, and there's a keg, there's, there's one keg left and it's going to be put on a hoo-ha bar on um, a week or two's time. Hoo-ha bar it's at South Brisbane, it's a craft beer joint. So um, that, that's, 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 there's, there's, there's like lots it. that's of favourites. Yeah, that's, that's one. <laughs> Okay, what software do you use for WP Curve project management? Uh, we use Slack and then we use Help Scout for tickets and then I've built a, a system that sits on top of Help Scout that allows our devs to do some uh, prioritisation of tickets that you can't do in Help Scout. So like one example is if, a, if like a VIP customer requests something, I want that job escalated. So we have like a, a, our own system that does some of those things. Yeah. Right. Project management. I don't really use anything for project management other than Google Docs and Slack and Trello. Okay. Trello's good for project management because you can just have like, I, with the crowdfunding, I, I, actually this is all public, but there's a, a board I've got which is like a 10 week crowdfunding plan. Um, and all it is is like week one all the way through to 10 and then it's like a list of jobs to do on every single one of those weeks. And it's just like a drag and drop. If you haven't seen Trello, it's just like post-it notes, drag them around, and it's free. Um, that's, that's really useful and yeah. you can tag people. Trello's great. Um, have you ever started anything not knowing how it's going to make money or what the revenue model is going to be? Uh, well, yeah, the one that failed, uh, well, I don't know about that. I always think I know what it's going to be, but I'm plan. always wrong. Right, yeah. so it evolves. <laughs> yeah, so even with okay. the brewery, like we were, I, I, I read the pitch deck the other day and it said 17% revenue at the cellar door and 87%, sorry, 83%. Um, Keg, uh, keg, wholesale kegs. And at the moment we're, we're doing more than 50% at the cellar door. Nothing's really changed except we just launched and we didn't, we actually didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. So, but, but no, I, I don't, I think that's a really bad idea. I mean, <laughs> unless there's some exceptions, like if you're doing a big funded startup and you're an entrepreneur who's, you know, got a history of launching these companies like that are like epic Facebook type mm -hmm. of companies, fine. But generally launching a business where you have no idea how you're going to make money is just a disaster. Every, every single person I know who's ever tried to do that has failed. Good advice. Do you find you identify more closely with your business that produces a physical product than a service? And does yeah. it affect how you care Definitely. about it? Yeah, for sure. And even just having, one thing I learned employing people locally is I actually really like working with mm -hmm. people locally and I find it a lot more productive, which is kind of random because I've, I've been you know, I've got 40 developers that are 100% remote and I've never had any staff at WP Curve. Yeah. Um, but I really like working with people locally. Um, it's totally different. Like, it just captures your attention because, like, you're there. F the yes. same faces come in. You know, you're, you're having meetings. Like, people are relying on you to get stuff done. So, remote work is actually really hard. It's like, it's... A lot of people will say it's great, but it's actually really hard to stay motivated and, and connected with it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, this is an interesting one. Love your approach to life, very refreshing. You seem very informal and unorthodox, but you have an orthodox business. Reconcile the difference. Uh, hmm. Well, I don't think it's that. What, which business is it? Who asked that question? That was fairly early one? on, actually. <laughs> um, don't know how to reconcile that. <laughs> don't know. I, I mean, the, the business itself was, was a very new idea. Like, <clears throat> the idea of doing unlimited small jobs for WordPress, I was the first person, as far as I know, to do that. Mm. Even to do it for other types of businesses was 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 very new. Yeah. Um, and the idea of like building this sort of scalable startup that was a service business was pretty new. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, definitely. The brewery is probably a bit more mainstream, but <coughs> I think most of what I do is l probably a little bit different to the average person, but maybe not too far different. When you get too too creative, it just ends up being a disaster. Like I had all these ideas for apps, <coughs> so bad. Um, but if you get that that created then it ends up harming you. 
because you just get too far away from reality, yeah. I think. Yeah. Where do you see yourself in another five years? I uh, just do the same, doing the same stuff. Oh, come on. Yeah. What were you I, doing I just, five years ago? What's that? <laughs> what were you doing five years ago? Trying to be here. <laughs> I was, I was just trying to be, <laughs> trying to be in, this, in a situation it's where a I was, answer. yeah. <clears throat> I mean, for so long I was doing a business that wasn't making any money. I just felt like a failure. I just wanted to be in a position where I was making enough money and um, able to help other people, able to work on something I love every day, yep. um, able to live near the beach and that, and you know, have good relationships and all of that. So. so you don't think you'll give any of these other ideas some air time? In the next five years? I don't know. I want to do this drone thing for sharks. I think it'd be pretty <laughs> sick. But I don't know. <coughs> we'll see. <laughs> I like that. You can all ask him about that in the uh, next round of networking. Are there any final questions from anyone here? No? All right. Well, please join me in thanking Dan very much for participating.